Happy New Year. It's 2024, specifically January 5th, 2024. You've tuned in to the Room Now podcast, and I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. I really do want to wish you a happy 2024. We've had a great number of years together. It's going to be a great 2024 going forward. I want to um, give you my New Year resolutions. Um, and the whole podcast is going to be dedicated to everything I'm not going to do this year. No. I think that these are some simple resolutions that may apply to you because I know they're going to apply to me. First, um, in this year, I'm going to double down on the things that I'm good at. You know, instead of taking on a lot of other activities, you know, there's an expanse of things that we're being asked to do, we're being asked to develop, we're being asked to, why don't you join us, whatever. You know, I really think that it's smart for me, my career, my life, and those that I serve, if I'm great and getting better at the things that um, I need to be great at. And sometimes that's not doing more things. It's just coning down on the things that you think are your priorities. I love the quote from Vince Lombardi that says that there is no perfection, but the relentless pursuit of perfection yields excellence. And that's sort of what I'm talking about here. Along with that, my second resolution is just say no. Not just to drugs, like Nancy Reagan told us, but really say no to all the things that you're wasting your time on. And, of course, we all know that saying no to those other people is in many ways saying yes to you. And I think a little bit of selfishness is probably good for one's um, being mental health and productivity but really learning to say no uh and i and as i said that's part of that pairing down to the things that you really want to focus on um and lastly something i really need to work on and that's learning how to count i'm actually actually pretty good at math but when i say learning how to count i'm talking about counting to 10 you know you're driving someone cuts you off the things that will fly out of your mouth and eyeballs are interesting, to say the least. Um, or someone's going to disappoint you at work. Or a discussion is going to go the wrong way with your spouse or your mate. I think instead of being smart and reactive, that gets you into trouble. I think learning how to count to ten and be measured in your response to the world will, I think, make your world a little less dramatic and full of angst. So I definitely need to learn how to count to 10. So today on the podcast, I think I've got 10 items. So I'm probably not going to go much beyond that. I'm going to begin with um, an announcement this week from uh, a company that's doing a phase 1B trial of with an IL-1 uh, receptor antagonist inhibitor, something like anakinra, but it's actually gene therapy. So this is a recombinant adenovirus-associated vector that expresses IL-1 RA, and it's going to be used as an intraarticular therapy in osteoarthritis of the knee, a 50-patient, 10-center trial. Um, I like this approach because I was involved in the original Anakinra trials. Oh, by the way, Anakinra is a drug that is approved for use in rheumatoid arthritis where it does work, but yet none of you use it. Um, and back then when we were look, talking about the advantages of inhibiting interleukin-1, you know, we certainly looked to the joint and its effects on cartilage and and even postulated on its potential greatness in osteoarthritis. Over the years, there's been a number of trials, small anecdotal trials, very few control trials, with some mixed results. And, um, and that's not different than any other trials in osteoarthritis when you come to think of it. 
but I will. Uh, I do think that there's enough evidence to go forward with the study, and I and I'll point to the the Canto study. Remember the Canto study? That was canakinumab given to patients just with heart failure, or I'm sorry, high risk cardiovascular indications to see that it would inhibiting the cytokine IL one um, would prevent those cardiovascular events. Remember that one of the offshoots of that study was that there were less gout attacks and onset, that there was less um, need for osteoarthritis um, joint replacement surgery. So again, I think that this is interesting. I think it may um, be something that certainly would be great to have uh, um, some more effective therapies for osteoarthritis, our number one disorder for which we really do not have effective therapies. That would be a wish for 2024. Uh, I like CNS lupus. It's one of my pet topics that I can wax on for uh, quite a long time, much to your chagrin. The, there was a meta-analysis of, of neuropsychiatric lupus um, looking at is there a difference in the neuropsychiatric manifestations based on whether you have lupus um, at a younger age or an older age. And they had almost 18,000 lupus patients. Uh, um, in f- this is 44 studies, by the way. With almost 18,000 with lupus onset under age 50. I don't think of that as young lupus. But then they have over age 50 as late onset lupus. I would say that's late onset. I probably would have done the dividing at 40. But nonetheless, what they did show that... Um, CNS manifestation of lupus in this study, focusing on reports on CNS lupus, so it's going to be a little skewed. They found 16% incidence of CNS lupus. You know, if you actually do a, a real intensive survey of your patients, 50% of patients will have some sort of neuropsychiatric manifestations. But this is sort of closer to what's in the literature where you're not doing intensive surveys of people. When they looked at um, the manifestations, uh, the CNS manifestations, they were more common uh, in younger onset patients than older onset patients, about 41% more common. And that the younger patients were more likely to have the classic manifestations that you associate with neuropsychiatric lupus, previously known as lupus cerebritis, and that would include seizures and psychosis. Um, what were the older onset lupus patients more likely to have as far as CNS manifestations? Well, the only one that panned out in a statistical way was um, a 60% higher incidence of peripheral neuropathy. That's kind of what I've seen over the years. Uh, we have talked in past meetings from ACR and ULAR about this Chinese um, drug called Teletacicept, which is a, it's also just shortened as Tele. It's a FC fusion protein that inhibits both BAF and April, so it's sort of a dual B cell inhibitor. Uh, it's been studied in um, a number of conditions, including RA and Sjogren's, where the preliminary early phase two reports look like they're positive. This is an early phase two B randomized control trial in 249 patients with lupus, uh, non-renal lupus. And the week 48 um, responses favored teletacicept. You And they, the primary endpoint was an SRI4 endpoint. Um, and they compared, there were three doses that they used. So the placebo response was... Um, uh, of 34%, but the 80 milligrams, 160 milligrams, 240 milligrams, 71 to 76% responses. So double the response. Great, but it's phase two. We need to see more studies with this compound, but this is encouraging if you're in the lupus um, clinical trial arena. Uh, interesting data came out this week from Norway about a decreasing incidence of SLE, um, especially in women in the age 50 to 59 year bracket. So in their population-based study, they had uh, almost 1,600 confirmed uh, SLE patients, and they looked at um, um, 797 that were new onset between over a 20-year period, like 1999 to uh, 2017 inclusive, 
and they showed over time that the rates were falling, not statistically so in every case, but certainly in certain brackets, especially that 50 to 59 year bracket where the incidence fell from three, uh, an incident rate fell from three to um, one per 100,000. Um, by the way, this is, remember, um, Northern European, Scandinavian, predominantly white, low incidence of lupus. If you look at all the lupus studies and, and the trend, time trend uh, prevalence numbers, it's really quite a mix. So in situations where you, uh, you know, the, the population we worry most about would be um, uh, the Asian population, uh, African Americans, uh, blacks in general, um, and uh, also Hispanics, also some of the indigenous populations have, you know, a higher, pre- a much higher prevalence numbers and also more severe disease. It's not going down in all of those populations. It's quite variable. I, and I think while this is encouraging, if you live and practice in a predominantly white Northern European or Scandinavian like population, um, this is good news. But I think the news we really want to hear is not that the incidence is, or, or, or prevalence is going down, but that mortality rates are going down. Um, end stage kidney disease is going down. And I think that there is some evidence out there um, that's been reported in the last few years. Uh, a little bit of a shameful report for us rheumatologists comes from Spain. Um, I, I think this was uh, three hospitals in Spain, 758 patients with some sort of spondyloarthritis, basically half with Axpon, half with PSA. And what they found was that um, we are not so good at documenting disease activity in patients with AXPA and PSA. This was determined by a lot of electronic health record analysis and AI programming that looked at how well you documented things like the variables that would make up the ASDAS um, score or the BASDI scores. And in AXPA, only 35% of patients had enough information to calculate that. If you looked at PSA, it was only about 17% were documenting either the, the necessary information for DAPSA or a DASH-28. Tender joint count, swollen joint count, only documented 20% of SPA and 32% of PSA. Again, you know it when you see it, but you're not very good at doing the documentation or the metric that you may need to rely on in the future rather than patient doing okay. And I decided not to make a change in therapy. Uh, again, can you treat hypertension without measuring blood pressure? Why would you be a rheumatologist and not measure disease activity in some sort of reliable manner? Uh, I can't advocate more strongly for that. Whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter. Do a rapid do a CDI, do a DASH-28, do a hack. Um, I do a GAS score, global arthritis score, which is tender joint count plus hack score plus patient pain. And it works out. It correlates perfectly with uh, SDI. I think it's better than anything else, but that's what I do. Um, a nice study was a network meta-analysis. You know, I don't like network meta-analyses. They can often be um, manipulated by what you include and whatnot, but I, this was a network meta-analysis of, of 44 trials looking at um, the TNF inhibitors Jack, and JAK inhibitors and IL-17 inhibitors and their protective effects or potentially effects on the development of anterior uveitis in patients with AXPA. And in this study, they showed that, you know, um, the anterior uveitis rates were pretty low for um the TNF inhibitor monoclonal antibodies, the IL-17 inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors compared to placebo. So much so that the A anterior uveitis risk was lowest with TNF inhibitors, next lowest with JAK inhibitors, next lowest with IL-17, and you know what? Next lowest though with the Tanercept, which was, in fact, superior to placebo in, in preventing uveitis events. We often say, well, no, you don't you want to use uveitis. I mean, uveitis, you don't want to use etanercept when you're worried about uveitis. That's not necessarily true. Uh, another interesting uh, cross-sectional analysis 
looked at the risk of fall amongst RA patients. This study, 307 RA patients, um, and 16% of them were taking psychotropic drugs. Uh, psych- by psychotropics, I mean sedative hypnotics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and the benzodiazepine and anxiolytics. Uh, and it turns out that if you were on psychotropic drugs, about a quarter of the patients had at least one fall per year. And that RA patients who are on psychotropics versus those that are not on psychotropics, there was a doubling of the risk of falls. Not good. 39% versus 20%. So that, and, and the, after their adjustments, it was about a 63% increased risk. You need to be careful um, in your patients with RA. I mean, they're, they're more likely to fall by having RA, and they fall because of frailty, sarcopenia, pain, and then add on top of that the psychotropics. That can be a significant problem. Uh, speaking of frailty, a market scan data. Uh, looked at frailty in a large cohort, like 57,000 RA patients who were taking either a biologic or um, a targeted uh, synthetic, a JAK inhibitor, Uh, and 6% met the definition of frailty, and the frail patients were even more likely to have a serious infectious event. That means a hospitalizable infection like pneumonia, sepsis, urosepsis, meningitis, septic arthritis, etc. A 50% higher risk if you were frail with RA. Hmm. Moreover, you're a 40% higher risk to have an inpatient hospitalization. You know, this leads me to, you know, for a number of years, I was trying to focus my clinic and I never did get around to what I wanted to do, which is put a banner outside in the waiting room saying, you know, this year you get stronger. Strength and strong should be your number one words with all your patients because you know what? They hurt. Because they hurt, they do less. And because they do less, they they veg and they lose muscle mass and they get weaker. And when you're weaker, you hurt more when you try to do anything. And it's just a toilet spin down when you start having pain uh, and then you get weaker. And getting out of that hole is ridiculously hard. Promoting strength is maybe something we don't do enough of. Which leads me to the next report, which was, I thought, surprising. That sarcopenia, I would expect to be evident in osteoarthritis. They're older. Sarcopenia being a reduced muscle mass and reduced muscle function. Um, There are many um, different associations with sarcopenia. Um, This study of almost uh, 11,500 patients taken from NHANES um, looked at sarcopenia and its associations. And what they found was that sarcopenia was increased in osteoarthritis patients. Not a big surprise. That's a a 23% or an odds ratio of 1.23. It was um, more so increased um, and actually, depending on two different definitions, either 23% or 30% increase in sarcopenia in OA, but even more so a 54% in OA patients who are smokers. So sarcopenia being linked to smoking in osteoarthritis, I found surprising. Sarcopenia is important because such patients are at greater risk for uh, fragility fractures and disability and higher morbidity and mortality rates. Sarcopenia has been associated with um, aging and obesity and malnutrition and diabetes and vitamin D deficiency and systemic inflammatory disorders, etc. They are thinking in this report was that osteoarthritis is intermittently inflammatory. Maybe that's why they're at higher risk. I think it's multifactorial, but nonetheless, it's still the same issue. Maybe your patients with arthritis shouldn't be smoking. We know that. But looking at frailty, looking at sarcopenia, uh, and and having that mantra of strength and being strong in 2024 makes a lot of sense. Uh, Two more reports. Curcumin works in knee osteoarthritis. This was another network meta-analysis, 23 studies, uh, over 2,000 patients with knee OA, with six different comparative interventions, and compared with placebo, um, so curcumin by itself um, significantly reduced pain scores by as much as 63%, uh, and also reduced um, Womack scores by up to 19 
Womack points. Turns out that this was the case when you use curcumin by itself, curcumin with other analgesics, and curcumin with even non-steroidals. That patients on curcumin alone or in combination were less likely to need other rescue pain medicines. Again, this is multiple comparisons that were shown to be the case. And more importantly, that curcumin seemed to have less toxicity than it did with comparators like non-steroidals or um, even placebo. So I like this kind of data. I think we should know, we should maybe double down on curcumin and turmeric. My biggest problem with this is I don't know the, the appropriate dosing. And maybe the reason they did well on toxicity here is because nobody knows the right dosing here. Curcumin is anti-inflammatory. If you look up the mechanism of action on this, it's dizzying and confusing, and it's like other nutraceuticals that work. You know, I'm, I've talked in the past about the use of Montmorency cherries, tart cherries, and cherry extract. You know, those are um, potentially COX-2 inhibitors, but they got a lot of other things going on along with the berries. And, and, and this is kind of what you see with nutraceuticals and plant-derived um, um, medicinal products. But nonetheless, I think that there's ample evidence that this works um, besides this particular NMA, and I would like to see more research on appropriate dosing. Lastly, there was a, a Danish report about weight loss in gout. Congratulations to them. They did a prospective randomized control trial of 61 gout patients who were obese, average BMI of 36. Uh, mean age here was 60 years of age. A third of the patients were on urate-lowering therapy. Their entry uric acid was 7.7 as a mean. They gave them, they, the intervention was a strict diet that was in two different phases, you know, supervised by a dietitian, and you know how hard they can be, um, versus um, a standard diet. And there was a significant difference in weight loss, 15 kilos versus 7 kilos, but you know what? Those who lost weight did not do better with regard to their gout, nor with regard to their uric acid levels. So they had the same amount of pain, fatigue, and gout flares. Now, if you look at the data on this, you know, the patients that went in were fairly stable. Um, very few of them were had hyperuricemia going in. Um, they, the average number of tender or swollen joints going in was zero. So these were stable patients. Yet they did have a fair number of flares. I want to say almost 50% in both of the treatment groups. So uh, this might have not shown what you expected it to show because it's underpowered. Um, the patients might have been too mild or too stable to notice a difference here. But maybe this is true. Maybe weight loss isn't the most important thing you can do with your gout patients. By the way, are they going to do it? You know, I can't get them to take allopurinol or to use prednisone or colchicine correctly. Um, and I know we all want to rant about that, but you do need to know that when it comes to weight loss, um, it's frustrating. But usually you don't have a good plan for them other than say, you know, you should lose some weight and saying it in a snarky manner doesn't work all that well. But I do think that telling your patients to lose weight is important. If you look at weight loss clinical trials or people who did lose weight, the number one reason they lost weight was because their doctor told them to. So um, we need to see, and there is some other studies that also show that weight loss may not be all that effective in gout. So this may require more study in the future. As you know, um, Room Now Live is coming up January 27, 28 in Dallas. You can be on site with us at the Westin Hotel, or you can um, tune in virtually from your desk. I want to review for you just the Sunday sessions. This is incredible. The morning session begins with the vasculitis mavens. Uh, Catherine Sims from Duke is talking about vasculitis and pregnancy. You won't hear that anywhere. GPA management from the great Anisha Dua from Northwestern. And then treat to target vasculitis, uh, a title I proposed and Philip Co said, oh, I want to do that. So that's going to be a killer. All right. Then we're going to have a few of these TED Talks, one from uh, Mike Putman on 
uh, myths and mistakes in reviewing the literature. Uh, and then Lisa Christopher Stein is going to talk about uh, serologic evaluation of myositis patients. There's a lot going on there and a lot of new advances. And to have a real expert like her put it together for you, it's going to be fabulous. Then you can go get a cookie and a cup of coffee and come back for the final session of the day, which is spondyloarthritis. Eric Ruderman talking about non-radiographic axial spa. Um, Leahy Eater from Toronto is going to talk about the impact uh, assessing enthesitis and spondyloarthritis and what it means in practice. And then lastly, Leanne Gensler from UCSF is going to talk about the advances in therapy in axial spondyloarthritis. And then we're going to have a great panel discussion at the end of that. Um, be there. Room Now Live, January 27, 28. Now's the time to register. Take care.